Hey guys, Tammy here. And in this video, we're going to talk about the anxiety inside when you are trying to figure out how to respond to the narcissist. Okay. I mean, I did a video a few days ago about what it feels like when you get the message from them. But in this one, I want to talk more about, I mean, not necessarily maybe responding to the narcissist, but when you need to communicate with them, right? Communicating with the narcissist when you're the one that needs to craft a message to them and you just have that anxiety. It's like, oh, I know I need to communicate about this, but I just don't really want to. And I dread it or I put it off because I just don't even want to start the interaction with them, right? <laughs> Let me just as always remind you, um, if you like this content, don't forget to hit like on the video. Also subscribe to the channel so that you get notified as new videos are released. Please also, as always, share on whatever social media channel that you're on so that we can help as many people as we can help. So when you need to communicate with your narcissistic co-parent about the kids, um, you know, there's some key tactics that I always tell people to use to try to minimize, minimize the risk of having an attack or a negative response back. Okay. Now I'm not saying it's going to eliminate it. It's not going to eliminate it because you're not going to, you know, if I ever learn how to completely eliminate it with a narcissist, uh, I will be a very rich woman, right? But that's not the current state of affairs. So when you're going through this and you need to, to do things that are going to hopefully get you a response, right? Because sometimes it that's what happens. They shut down and don't respond. Or uh, um, they will turn around and attack you. Or um, they will come back with 500 questions. Okay. <laughs> that is usually what happens when we're doing this. And I'm going to kind of give you a little example. I had a client that, um, the child had the opportunity to go with a friend for a little event on what would be transition day. And, um, so I helped mom craft a message about, okay, um, the child is, invited to this thing with a friend. Um, it's transition day. That means the child would need to be picked up at such and such time. Um, please let me know if that's okay with you. Okay. And then there was no, there was no like, yes, uh, there, there was no, there was no immediate yes. Right. There wasn't a response that came back where dad was like, oh yeah, sure. That's fine. No problem with me. And then started asking questions. First dad asked the questions. He's like, okay, well, you know, where would the pickup be? Well, what time? Well, can you transport him to me if needed? And there, it was like, it was like two or three different questions that came through before he finally said yes at the very end. Okay. And that can feel really frustrating because we know what they're doing. We're kind of, they're kind of emotionally stringing us along, right? Just to kind of manipulate it. Or maybe they were hoping that we would look bad to the kid because we couldn't tell the kid yes right away. I don't know. I don't know what goes through people's minds always. But what I can tell you is that I said to my client, like, just stay calm. Just answer the questions. You know, what what time is the pickup this time? Where would the pickup be? Here's the address. Would you be able to drive the child to me after, you know, after she's dropped off. Yes, sure. You know, about what time would that be this time, whatever. And you just kind of go through the motions and you kind of, you kind of play the game, right? When you're, when you're dealing with that. But when you're crafting the message in the first instance, here's a couple of tips that I always give people. One, you want to use unifying language. And by that, I mean, we, us, words like that, that kind of pit the two of you against the problem, as opposed to me and I, which, which pits us against each other. And it's a very subtle shift. But I think especially with a narcissistic person, the reason this works so well 
is because it sort of strokes their ego, right? Oh, you see them as equal to you or or whatever. And and there's just something about it that it also feels inclusive to them. Um, and I think that they kind of, um, they struggle with that with people. And narcissists usually want people to like them, oddly enough. Um, so there's just a lot of different reasons why that unifying language will work. Um, and then I try to make it as neutral as possible as far as I'm concerned. So in other words, in this particular instance, I wouldn't have said anything like, hey, my friend, like, let's say this was like my best friend, okay, that wanted to take to, wanted to take the kid to, I don't know, let's say Disney World. Like we all know what, you know, where Disney World, is, you know what that is, right? When I say that. So let's say it was like some big thing like that. And my best friend, let's say, has a kid my kid's age. And I wouldn't write and say, hey, my best friend, Sarah, um, wants to know if, you know, our child can go with her child to Disney World next week on Wednesday and they're going to be going and coming at this time and you know I think it would be really fun for our child and I know you have to work that day anyway so it's not really going to interfere with your parenting time and da, da, da. you're you're already like when I'm crafting a message like that I'm already giving all of these like competing um opinions, right? I'm saying, well, you have to work. Well, maybe in their mind, they're going, well, actually I'm off that day. Or maybe they're going, well, I don't really care if I have to work. The child, it's still my parenting time. It's my decision. You know, different things like that pop into people's brains, depending on the dynamic of the relationship, the type of narcissist they are, you know, all those kinds of things. So you don't want to give like your opinions on whether this person should agree with you or not, or, or whatever. Um, so that unifying language can be really important. The other thing that I like to do is I like to give two options where I can. And if you've listened to me for any time, you know I'm big on this. Like if my friend said, hey, I'd like your daughter to go with us to, you know, my daughter, like your daughter to go with us to Disney World, we can either go on you know, Saturday the 14th or Saturday the 21st, would one of those days work for you? Okay, then if I was going to communicate with dad and ask dad if the kid could go one of those weekends, I wouldn't say, would that work for you? I don't ask a yes or no permission question with a narcissist. I say, hey, our child has been invited to go to Disney World with this other child, they're thinking of going either the 14th or the 21st. Um, Both of those days are transition days. Um, Do you have a preference of, you know, which day we pick? And so you just kind of assume the cooperation, right? As opposed to saying, would that be okay with you? you know, something along those lines of when you can give a choice. I mean, sometimes you have to just say, here's the date. That's the only one option. And you you just have to kind of say, would that work for you? I kind of tend to like to to use that kind of language. But um, but in instances where you can give multiple choices with a narcissist, it helps them feel in control. So when I'm going to write them about something that I need to get done if I could come up with two options like if I'm getting the kid into a therapist and the therapist said I can do Thursdays at three or I can do Wednesdays at two then I would say hey I called the therapist that we had contacted Um, they have options for weekly visits at Wednesday at 2 p.m. Thursday visits at 3 p.m. which one of those would you prefer especially if like you don't care it doesn't matter to you it works either way great Let them make the choice. Giving them control over those little pieces will make them easier to deal with. And when you can master some of these techniques, like using, like I try to use neutral, I don't go back and forth, like I said, me, you, all that. Neutral language, unifying words, um, giving them choices. When you can start to master that kind of thing, 
the response you'll get from them when you have to communicate about something will be so much easier. I mean, I've had people come back and say, wow, I can't believe the change in the other person within a week of doing this, Tammy. And I'm always like, yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's just that we are emotional and understandably so. And nobody taught us these techniques. Nobody, I don't know about you, but I didn't have a narcissist class in school of how to deal with this. And honestly, even the things I learned early on 20 years ago where, you know, I'd read things or whatever and learn or, or go to workshops or, or whatever and learn certain ways, it still is not the same as actually applying this over and over and over and seeing what works and what doesn't. Like it's very nuanced in every case. So it really does take some time to kind of figure out your person and figure out what works and what doesn't. And don't get frustrated in the beginning. If you don't get the exact response you want, you'll probably get a better response than what you've been getting. And then as you learn to apply these techniques more and more, it'll improve more and more and more as you go along. I hope that helps to decrease your anxiety in regards to communicating with your narcissist about necessary things for your kids. If you'd like to learn more about my services, you can go to divorceuniversityonline.com forward slash VIP dash coaching. There's a link on that page where you can book a time to talk to me, learn more about my coaching services and how I might be able to help you on this journey. See you guys next time.